Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner in our DC studio. It is good to have you here with us. Pro-lifers call on the Senate to uphold pro-life protections in health care. Republican leaders pushed a health care bill through the House last week with two critical pro-life provisions. It prevents taxpayer funding of health care plans that cover abortion on demand and it redirects taxpayer dollars away from Planned Parenthood to comprehensive health care centers. But the health care reform bill still has some hurdles to get through before becoming law. The Senate needs to vote on it next, and Republican senators are making clear their measure will differ from the House's version. To explain what this all means for the pro-life movement, we are joined now by Marjorie Janenfelser, the president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Marjorie, good to see you. Oh, always good to be here. Thanks. So how much should pro-lifers be celebrating the passage of this bill, and how do you prioritize the different provisions in it? I think that's the most important question. As Catholics, as pro-lifers, we have to think about what comes first. The right to life is the spring, the wellspring of every other right. So if we haven't protected the right to life in this health care bill, then we haven't done anything to further pre-existing conditions, parts of it. So the two things that have to be protected in the Senate bill when it comes up, which is going to be in the next couple of months, mm -hmm. are defunding Planned Parenthood, yes, mm -hmm. and also making sure that our tax dollars do not go to supporting health care plans that fund abortion. So it's the Hyde Amendment attached to the health care bill. How confident are you the Senate will pass it with those pro-life provisions? Well, I think all the things that we're hearing on the Hill today, all the things that we have been communicating with the White House, with the Speaker, with the leader of the Senate, mm -hmm. and now on the staff level, are that everyone knows that this bill will not pass if the Hyde Amendment provisions are, are not in it mm -hmm. and if defunding Planned Parenthood is not in it. So that means that our voice is very strong, mm -hmm. not only our voice, but our voice is now the voice of the Senate leaders and the House leaders and the White House. You're the ones making these decisions. It's big. Now, Senator yeah. Joe Manchin, a Democrat from West Virginia, a state where Trump easily won, He's been walking this tightrope lately. He yeah. was seen holding a sign in support of Planned Parenthood and then seen holding a sign in support of defunding Planned Parenthood. Can you explain this political climate that a lot of Democratic senators are facing? Yeah, it really is, for this individual leader, a, a manic moment, a kind of a bipolar going from yeah. one extreme to the other. I, I heard him comment or his staffer commented mm -hmm. that whatever sign that he holds up, like it's just going to reflect his cons constituents views that this can't be mm. what a person that we elect to public office says you have to believe in what you believe the either either if you are a person who believes in the right to life you know that that is the font of every other right just like in the health care bill so I'm meeting with him um, we're gonna talk about one more shot at saying that he will commit to a vote that would defund Planned Parenthood there will be an opportunity in the Senate there will be a, an amendment a specific amendment as this bill moves forward mm -hmm. to um, to defund Planned Parenthood, we will ask him. I will ask him to mm -hmm. vote the right way on this, um, to reflect the conscience of the person that he says that he has been from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a point of prayer and a point of vigilance for the grassroots and, and the country. Marjorie Dana <laughs> Felser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Thanks for being here. Thank you. The repeal bill still has a few steps to go before getting signed into law. Pro-lifers need to make sure our voice is heard as negotiations continue and the Senate prepares to vote on the health care bill. For this week's call to action, we must urge the Senate to pass a health care repeal bill with the two critical pro-life provisions. Here is how you can get involved. Make sure to write this down or put this website into your smartphone or computer right now. Go to sba-list.org forward slash EWTN. By going to this website, you can send a message to the U.S. Senate to keep pro-life provisions in the health care bill. Here's what we need to make sure remain in the health care reform. First, it must prevent taxpayer funding of health care plans that cover abortion on demand. And second, the plan must redirect taxpayer dollars away from Planned Parenthood to health care centers that provide comprehensive primary and preventative care to women and girls. The pro-life movement needs to be clear that those two provisions are non-negotiable. Go to sba-list.org forward slash EWTN to send the pro-life message to the U.S. Senate. Personnel is policy, or so the common political refrain goes, from the Department of Health and Human Services to key positions in the White House. 
President Trump is stacking his administration with a staff that has major pro-life credentials. So what does this mean? What can we make of President Trump's pro-life policies so far? We're joined now by Katie Talento from the White House, who serves as Special Assistant to the President for Health Policy. Katie, thank you for your time. Of course. Thank you, Catherine, for having me. Our President, President Trump, is admittedly a convert to the pro-life cause. Within the administration, what is the greater vision for implementing pro-life health care policies throughout President Trump's term? You're right, Catherine, when you talk about how his personal experience and friendship with someone really led him to his pro-life position. And um, that, I think, has really guided a lot of what we've been doing ever since I first started working on the transition team right after the election, even during the campaign. We were planning his pro-life agenda and how it might be enacted. So I think you've seen uh, really great steps already, and we have great steps to, to be continued in the future. So first of all, I mean, right away, right off the bat, the first full day he was in office, um, he implemented a presidential memorandum that would reestablish, reinstate the Mexico City policy which um, it's updated, meaning it covers more programs to reflect the current structure of foreign aid today. And what that means is that we're not going to fund the international abortion industry anymore. And so that was a really important first step. And then, of course, um, he also defunded the United Nations Population Fund, which is a global abortion promoter and provider. Uh, another great step he took was to um, signed the, the Congressional Resolution of Disapproval of the Family Planning Program. And what it did is it didn't defund family planning. It didn't reduce family planning programs um, by one dollar. All it did was it allowed states the option to defund or deprioritize abortionists in their states. So there were a handful of states that had wanted to defund abortion providers in their family planning program with their federal family planning uh, uh, funding. And, and the Obama administration had forbidden them from doing this. And so um, Congress passed a resolution of disapproval of this regulation, and Donald Trump proudly signed that uh, piece of legislation. So that was exciting. I think we've also been part of the defunding Planned Parenthood for at least one year and shifting those funds into community health centers. So we actually took the savings that from the Planned Parenthood funding, doubled those savings, and put them into comprehensive women's health care at community health centers. There are many more community health centers around the country, Catherine, that, that provide treatment for the whole woman and, and her children. And so uh, it's such a better use of money to take money from, from the single service abortion providers and put them into comprehensive women's health care. And so that's what the Obamacare repeal and replace bill would do. We're really excited about that too. And then most recently, Catherine, you may have just seen, we had a religious liberty executive order that the president signed just last Thursday, which was the National Day of Prayer. And he had the Little Sisters of the Poor come up on the stage with him because what it was about was saying that the government is no longer going to discriminate against you merely because of your religious beliefs. Katie, you hit on one point, defunding Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood claims, though, if they are defunded, women's health care in the United States would suffer. As a health care expert, how do you respond to that claim? Well, I mean, Planned Parenthood only serves part of the woman. And that's a great thing is that um, we're taking these savings from Planned Parenthood and doubling them, putting them into comprehensive women's health care. We're not reducing funding for women's health care by one penny. And I think it's going to serve women and their children much better. Finally, Katie, you yourself are Catholic. How do you implement your Catholic faith into your work? Well, you know, when I first went into health policy, um, I wasn't really an activist on some of these uh, social issues, some of the life, the marriage. But um, as I've worked longer and longer in health policy, and particularly I've had some great mentors, people like Senator Sam Brownback and um, Chairman Henry Hyde, and just unbelievable people. And now I get to work with people like Vice President Pence and Kellyanne Conway, who are just leaders in, in this movement. What I've realized is that human dignity is what we're all about here in health policy. And I think that's why I get so passionate about it and so fired up. It's because what the coherent teaching that St. John Paul the Great talked to us about 
in the, the infinite worth of the human person, that's what we're talking about when we talk about healthcare. From women, their children, the unborn to the end of life, the most marginalized populations here in America, people struggling with addiction, people struggling with HIV, people overseas who are facing preventable diseases that they see their children dying from. These are all the issues I get to work on. And it's so exciting because it all connects to that, that theology of the body and the infinite worth the infinite human dignity that we have as human beings that we're born with and endowed with, by our creator with these with these these unalienable rights to life. And so I I love working on this issue and it really makes me think about um, about integrating my Catholic faith because I'll tell you something, the central mystery of the faith and of all human history is the incarnation, right? Mm -hmm. And if there's anything the incarnation was about it's human dignity. It's, it's endowing humanity with the, the unfathomable dignity of, of God. And so I feel like I get to work on the incarnation every day. That's what I get to come to work on. And so it's really exciting. I, this is a dream come true, working here at the White House and advancing the unbelievably powerful and empowering health agenda of the president. It's just, it's an honor and it's a privilege. And I, I can't believe they let me in the complex every day. Katie Talento, Special Assistant to the President for Health Policy, thank you for your time. Thank you, Catherine, so much. Turning now to pro-life news, activists are pushing for a vote on assisted suicide next year in South Dakota. People supporting assisted suicide are gathering signatures to vote on whether terminally ill patients can receive prescriptions for drugs to end their own lives. They need nearly 14,000 signatures by November. At least five states and the District of Columbia have already legalized assisted suicide in the U.S. Iowa Supreme Court blocks a portion of a pro-life law less than two hours after Governor Terry Branstad signed it. Iowa became the 20th state last week to ban late-term abortions after 20 weeks or five months of pregnancy. But the state Supreme Court blocked a restriction requiring women to wait 72 hours to get an abortion. Iowa Right to Life says it is flabbergasted by the injunction, calling it a sobering reality. The U.S. is one of only seven nations to allow abortion on demand more than halfway through pregnancy. This Sunday, we celebrate Mother's Day, whether it's through birth, adoption, or even through spiritual motherhood. It is a day set aside to honor the mothers in our life. To discuss the unique role mothers bring to our society and some of the real challenges they face today, we are joined by this week's expert panel. Mary Rice Hassan is the mother of seven children and director of the Catholic Women's Forum at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Elizabeth Kirk is an attorney, a writer, and a mother of four adopted children. How fitting to be speaking about motherhood with a Mary and an Elizabeth. Thank you both for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Mary, can you speak to the uniqueness of femininity and mother and the gift that motherhood is to the church and to our culture? Yeah, great question, because it's something that's tremendously underappreciated mm -hmm. right now. So, you know, when I think of motherhood, I think one of the things that is sort of lost is this idea that we are different. Mm -hmm. And women, when we, you look at us, we're created with room for another. So just, just that, that sense of who we are physically is a message for the church. Mm. It's a message for everyone, that every person's created for others mm. and to give of themselves to others. But, but we women get to put that into practice, you know, in, in carrying a child, but just have that reminder whether we're called physical motherhood or, or spiritual motherhood or, or anything like that. That is beautiful. So. That is unique, and that is something we should embrace. Yeah, we have to embrace our femininity, right. embrace our motherhood. Now, Elizabeth, abortion numbers greatly outnumber adoption numbers. Yeah. Why do you think this is happening? And how can the pro-life movement better promote adoption? Yeah, it's, it's the, the statistics are astounding. Mm. The number of abortions in this country exceeds a million annually. The number of infant adoptions mm -hmm. domestically mm -hmm. is less than 20,000 by the most you know, generous estimates. Um, in terms of why, I think it's a very complicated thing, but I think one of the main reasons is that there's a stigma against adoption mm -hmm. in the sense that many uh, women who are in a crisis pregnancy don't consider adoption as a meaningful choice. Mm -hmm. Women who are asked about their reasons for abortion, if they even consider adoption at all, they state that uh, adoption isn't something they considered, and if they did consider it, 
they rejected it because they think it's morally wrong to abandon their baby and the thought of their child being out there in the world without them knowing anything about it would induce more guilt than having an abortion. And we know that in some cases Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. reinforces this um, idea that adoption is more traumatic than abortion. Mm. So that's something I think as pro-lifers we need to be aware of and we need to work against. Yes. You know what, that, that actually makes me think of one of the essential tasks of a mother mm. is to affirm the significance of their child. Mm. In other words, you look into that child's eyes and it's, you are amazing. God created you. And, and so just affirming their significance, the fact that they exist, and abortion just strikes so directly against that mm. so that these women are being sort of persuaded erroneously that it's better not to even kind of acknowledge and give that child life even if someone else raises the child. And that child does have a purpose. How do we yeah. uh, articulate that though in a society that continues to strip away at gender differences and, and a culture where it's sometimes uncomfortable to talk about motherhood? Right. I think some of it is because there's a, people for many years were um, rejecting the idea that we're determined by the fact that we can bear children and that's all women can mm. do. And certainly there were prejudices and and things like that. But mm -hmm. I think we as women have to really embrace the fact mm -hmm. that we are women and, and own those differences and yet change the conversation that these differences are something to be valued. Yeah. You know, I, I think of Pope John Paul II's words that women see with eyes of the heart. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's what we bring to every situation, that acknowledgement of, of just the value of the person and, and their goodness and, and being able to nurture and, and encourage them. I'm sure you find that mm -hmm. yourself. Right, that's beautiful. And Elizabeth, in terms of adoption, mm -hmm. how can we better celebrate those birth mothers to tell them this is a brave choice? Yeah. Well, I think uh, following what Mary said, I think we need to we need to reject the uh, you know the idea that women are somehow being bad mothers because mm -hmm. they place their child for adoption. It's it's in fact it's a great act of motherhood, mm -hmm. right? To put your own yeah. your own needs and your own wants and your own very natural desires put your, the good of your child ahead of those things. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to first acknowledge that they are good mothers. Mm -hmm. I think birth mothers themselves can be the most beautiful witnesses for mm -hmm. this message. Mm -hmm. I think adoptive parents need to be very careful that we don't objectify birth, birth parents mm -hmm. as a means to a child, right? I mean, mm -hmm. when you adopt a child, you are building a relationship with the birth families, and it's, it's a, a lifetime relationship. Mm -hmm. It's not just something that happens once. So mm -hmm. adoption is in service to the child, but also to the birth parents. About 6% of married women in the U.S. struggle with infertility. This is a very real issue that impacts a lot of families. So how do we celebrate motherhood uh, while being sensitive and being aware of those women who are struggling with infertility? I, I think it's very important to be sensitive to it because mm -hmm. it's a very silent cross sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a, especially in an age when many people are childless by choice. Sometimes people don't realize that you're struggling with infertility. It's also, as Mary was talking about, how um, motherhood, you know, our physical capacity for motherhood is part of what makes us uniquely feminine. Mm. And so it, it's part of what makes this a very painful cross. If you can't, as a woman, conceive and bear a child, mm. that strikes at the heart of your femininity. It strikes at the heart of a marriage. The two become one, literally, in your child. And so mm. it's a very painful, painful cross. But I think there are things that we can do to celebrate motherhood nevertheless to realize that all marriages are called to be fruitful right. no, whether or not you can have biological yeah. children yeah. I think that's yeah. important to emphasize. And we have um, one of our previous pastors had a practice of always praying around Mother's Day for those who were called to be mothers mm. in whatever way and bringing in just that idea that we can be called to spiritual motherhood or, mm. or mothers by adoption or mothers by you know some other arrangement that comes about, you're, you're taking care of your, your sister's children or, or whatever it might be, but then also praying too for those who desire to be parents and, and just to recognize that and, and to pray for that. So. And sometimes it's sim as simple as asking your pastor to do that. They may mm. not realize mm -hmm. that that's something that they're, yeah. you know, that there's a need in the, in the, in the pew. And so. that, that would be welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It's like you said, it is a silent cross sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you both for your witness and happy Mother's Day to you both. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. When we come back, hear the heartbreaking news story about how the culture of death is now impacting fashion. And we sit down with a mainstream actress who is proudly pro-life. Stay tuned as EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back. 
Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner. For this week's Speak Out segment, we turn to a news item that, as one Catholic bioethicist put it, illustrates the crassness of our age. A small Australian company, Baby Bee Hummingbirds, is turning embryos into keepsake jewelry. An embryo is a human person at an early stage in life. The jewelers say their products are a way for families to gently close the door to the lives of extra embryos created in the in vitro fertilization or IVF process. The pieces of jewelry range from 80 to $600. The Catholic Church opposes IVF because all human life, including those in an embryonic state, have invaluable dignity. This is heartbreaking because these pre-born humans are being further commoditized. But this also points to the real pain experienced by women suffering with infertility who then try IVF. The Baby Bee Hummingbirds jewelers say they want to help women signify the end of their embryo's journey instead of paying expensive storage fees or having to discard the frozen embryo. But this dilemma wouldn't exist in the first place if it wasn't for IVF. In vitro fertilization has high failure rates, not to mention can cost in the six-figure range. Women should never be in a place where they need to ask what to do with their unborn baby, a baby who, if allowed to fully develop, would be able to wear jewelry themselves. What the jewelers call embryo ash is, in fact, an unborn human child, not a craft store product. Finally, we must remember children are such a gift. We do not have a right to children, and we certainly do not have a right to take an unborn human child and use them as part of a sentimental accessory to wear around our neck. Remember, there is always something you can do to counter today's culture of death by following our call to action. Tell the U.S. Senate to keep the pro-life provisions in our health care reform. Go to sba-list.org forward slash EWTN to send your message for life. She's acted in films like Independence Day and television shows like Gossip Girl. But this actress is taking a stance that's not as mainstream. Margaret Cullen sits down with EWTN Pro-Life Weekly and explains why she is pro-life and not afraid to say it inside or outside the movie studio. Margaret, you are an actress who has starred in soap operas, major television shows, major movies. How did you get involved in the pro-life movement? I was always in the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was very involved in the pro-life movement when we were uh, kids. Mm. As soon as um, she heard about Roe versus Wade, she mobilized all of us. And um, that was the, the first time that they were political, my parents, in, in New York. So um, I was come from a pro-life family. How was that received by fellow actors and actresses? It's not very common someone from Hollywood comes out and says they are pro-life. Well, I'm pretty much from the New York area. So it's mm -hmm. uh, film and television mm -hmm. and also stage. So I've done a lot of stage work. And um, it isn't common but it's a wonderful opportunity to talk about it mm. so I people usually get to know me as an actor first and then um, we enjoy each other's company and we enjoy the work and then when it comes up in a sort of natural fashion uh, they're sometimes surprised but they already we already have each other's respect so there's an opportunity for dialogue maybe more willingness to hear you out and listen to you in that yeah regard. that they're actually meeting one of them one of those pro-lifers and uh, you know, I've been very, you know, pro-woman and pro-child mm -hmm. and very non-violent. So there's a, actually kind of a lot of us, things for us to talk about. Speaking of that, you are an honorary board member of the group Feminists for Nonviolent Choices. Yeah. Would you say it does go hand in hand being a feminist and being pro-life? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was the early tenements of the American feminist movement mm -hmm. to be pro-child. It was the... You know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and uh, in the revolution and the other early American feminists were all pro-life. Mm -hmm. They never would consider separating a woman from the life of her child, mm -hmm. ever. And, you know, woe to the man who puts that upon her, mm. to quote Stanton. So now I just think the biggest need is for us to get the word out there that we are pro-woman. Mm -hmm. and pro-child and non-violent. So mm -hmm. whatever the reasons are for a woman to seek an abortion in the first place, let's get to those root causes. Let's, let's her ma make her feel safe and pursue her education and get her health care and get her job mm -hmm. placement and help her take care of her baby. Margaret, you were raised in a Catholic family. Yeah. Has your faith shaped how you view life? It sounds like your parents had a big impact on your pro-life views. 
my mother and my father shaped everything about me, you know, and then there's a very healthy period of rebellion where you decide mm -hmm. what are the things that you uh, are going to take on as an adult. Mm -hmm. And um, I just found with my life as an actor, the day is sometimes, you know, not, doesn't have any shape. It goes from having a lot of shape, you have to be somewhere at five o'clock in the morning and then you work till, you know, midnight and then they give you two minutes off and a thousand dollar turnaround and you get up and do it again. And to days of, ap and months of no activity, you know, looking for auditions. So to this day, at this ripe old age, and from when I was a teenager facing days without structure, it was always mass in the gym. And I just find my faith is always reinforced. There's mm. so much to learn. So many genius people, the Thomistic Institute, there's so many genius people who call Catholicism their home mm. that I just really, I can't learn enough about it. Mm. What would you say to young actors and actresses who might be hesitant to enter the industry if they're Catholic and they're pro-life and they're afraid that maybe their views wouldn't be respected? Would you have an encouraging word for them? If you're afraid, don't go into this industry. Mm. There's, mm -hmm. the, if you're afraid, right. you're in the business of being rejected. That's what you do most often for a living as an actor. Mm -hmm. I don't hold it against the people who hire me, their political views, and I don't expect them to hold mine against me when they hire me. If I'm good for the job, I'm good for the job. Um, I don't think the workplace is a place all the time for a political exchange. When it happens, you do it with respect. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if you're pro-life, you should respect each other. Mm -hmm. So if you're afraid, don't go into the business. Do something else. Uh, and you are who you are. You know, you're good enough. We are good enough. So if your views are that life begins at conception, then explore that and kick that around happily with people, whatever work you do for a living, mm -hmm. whatever you do for a living. Margaret, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Very happy to be here. That's it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. You can reach us anytime at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. A very happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. Life is a gift. God bless.